you hear me, right? Okay. So, uh, hi guys, we are Urs and Igor, and we want to start off with a question. What is the importance of first times? So, um, basically, first times are like milestones in life. Uh, like the first time you kiss someone, Hello. the first time you... Uh, the first time you kiss someone, the first time uh, you uh, drop a car, the first time you work in Photoshop, and the first time you decide to put your day job and start a visualization studio. So today, um, we'll be drawing down this memory lane of ours, and we'll be talking about some of our prints and some of our first time experiences. So some of you may hear of us and some of you may not. We are edit, we come from lovely Serbia. And we are a relatively small and young studio existing for three years now, two, two of which are in active office work. So, considering the fact that this is probably the first time somebody from our country is speaking at the conference, and the fact that um, the fact that we are relatively new in the business, we wanted to talk a little bit about ourselves, how we started, and what motivated us to step into the world of our quiz. So, we are both. We were both architects. We met at the Faculty of Architecture in Belgrade. But we became good friends mostly because of our appreciation of two things, parks and beer. So, uh, you see, in Serbia you have two strong social currents of people. One of which, well, you probably have it everywhere, but one of which like to go out to clubs and overpay their drinks. And other ones are like people like us that like to uh, occasionally rather sit at the park bench and drink from a can. So this, so the pro part lifestyle will eventually prove itself to be crucial to the origins of our studio. So, um, considering the fact that we're architecture students, we were introduced to modeling fairly quickly, and we can talk about some of our old work, and you can see that it's pretty basic and shitty. Uh, but at the time, we were pretty full of ourselves, and we thought we kicked ass. But apparently, we were young and stupid back then, and we're probably not so young anymore. And this is, uh, after a while, we upgraded our modeling skill to something even more awesome, which is Photoshop. Now, we begin to keep in mind that we were just scratching the surface with this because we thought invert was the tool to use. So, during our studies, uh, we started doing some basic uh, modeling work, some basic rendering work, and some basic Photoshop work. And eventually, we graduated. So, as all young aspiring architects, we thought, well, our modeling skill skills, well, we should deserve some jobs, you know? And uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case, and we ended up chasing for jobs, and we forgot about one important thing, and that was the portfolio. So, as awesome as our images were, we thought, uh, they needed some improvement. So we started watching a lot of tutorials, mainly about post-production, and we started working on all kinds of images, and we were constantly sharing resources. Eventually, we were cooked in our quiz, and we admired the likes of Mirror, looks and gone, fix and place, etc. So, uh, our awesome post production skills eventually got us some jobs. It was very awesome. I was working at my father's company doing very exciting stuff in Microsoft Excel, calculating the amount of glue that is needed to waterproof houses. On the other hand, Norris was looking for a Romanian company selling contraband Italian furniture. <laughs> so, I mean, what could you expect from a company that was called Mob Expert? <laughs> so, needless to say, we were dissatisfied with how things were working out. We were constantly sending portfolios to architecture companies, but all we got was the same two replies. We don't have an open position right now, and the images look very good. So the first comment bummed us out really bad, but the second one was good enough to plant the seed in our head. So, one day we got up from work, we sat down on the park bench, grabbed a couple of cold beers, it was a very beautiful evening, very romantic when you think about it. And I was started discussing our first companies we admire, basically daydreaming how it would be to work in one of those companies. And then it hit us, well, not the beer, but the idea. We should do this for a living. We should form our own Arquist studio. And that night, we found an edit studio, and it was our first of the firsts. But before we could say that we were in the Arquist business, we needed a couple of things. First, we needed a name. So the working one we had was uh, 3D Edit. Very clever, yeah. So uh, we were discussing other names. We laughed about it at the time. And eventually, one of us figured out a way that we could invert the number three and thus get edit. And edit is a simple association to Photoshop, because in Photoshop, you're constantly uh, adjusting, compositing, editing. 
It was short, simple, broad, yet the character, and it connected to the two things we were all about, 3D and 2D production. So another thing on the list was creating an online portfolio in a website. So uh, we didn't have any experience in the art of this field, so our student work was all we had to show. So we both agreed that the important thing here was the selection of the work, quality before quantity. We also had to figure out the layout design for the site, as well as to find somebody that would program it for free because we didn't have any money. So uh, eventually, uh, luckily one of our friends is a programmer, he offered to help us out, and we paid him with a bottle of Rakia, which is a strong survey champ. So everything was set. We got the site published uh, along with the Facebook page. There was no more postponing the inevitable. We had to start looking for clients. Uh, we had to come up with a strong strategy, with a strong tactic that would put us out there on the web. So we thought of a brilliant idea. We started spamming. Now, other than it being very annoying and unprofessional, spamming has also proven itself to be a very bad promotional tool. Because think about it, uh, if you were to walk to somebody on the street and just say, hey, let's hang out, let's do something together, you know, it's very unnatural. So, in short, we sent like a thousand of emails, uh, we received only two replies, one of which was a simple compliment, and the other one was a potential job opportunity that went sour, so it didn't work. Uh, one other thing that we also did is we contacted companies we admired in order to get some starter advice. And even though you cannot say too many things to a stranger over Facebook, we ended up getting some really cool advices and suggestions. So, since our brilliant spamming idea didn't work, uh, luckily, simultaneously we were publishing uh, our work on social media and specialized forums. We, just, we did this in order to get some community uh, feedback from the community so that we could further improve our images. So all of this happened on your popular forums, such as uh, Ronan Beckerman, Evermotion, CG Architect, and on social media like Behance and uh, Facebook. And these are all really good platforms to promote your work on. And so we did get some good feedback from the community and from our colleagues, but it just wasn't a good enough outreach. We needed clients. So Orish and I started discussing the idea of doing a personal project together for promotional purposes. And at this point, uh, we got a request for a set of images from our dear friend and associate Diana Bajos, who is standing right over there. The, and it was, um, it was all done through Elance. It was sort of a, a villa project. It was all done through Elance. And the budget was very small. But we all agreed that we could benefit from the promotional aspect later on. So the villa itself was located somewhere near Johannesburg, and it was actually in the middle of nowhere, and this was ideal for us because it gave us freedom to treat the surroundings in post-production the way we thought was best. So uh, we started doing the uh, set of images, and one of them popped right out from the start. And it was the only image that we worked on together, and it was noticeable. So immediately we decided to publish the image via Ronan Beckerman's forum, and the next day it got highlighted as one of the images of the week, making it the first of our images that we worked on together, and the first of our images to be published on an internationally recognized forum. So from this moment onward, we realized that we should take focus on different kinds of promotional strategies. And as a result, we revisited our Elance profile and hopes of finding any kind of work. So um, we did get a lot of we prefer different style comments, but in the end it paid off. We were contacted by a neuron based company, Zero to One, to do a set of images for a local competition that we're working on. It was a sort of a sculpture located in some park in New York. So how bad can it be? So we immediately accepted and we realized that it was a level up in technical requirements in comparison to the last project we did. Because with the South African Villa, we got absolute freedom to treat the surroundings the way we wanted it to. But here we did, of course, get some requirements from the client. So uh, we had a reasonable deadline. We were able to uh, focus on the composition and on the details, and we finished the two images. The client was happy, and so were we. And we have to say that both of the images were also highlighted on the Ronan Beckerman forum as well. So these two first jobs weren't much, but they were enough to put us out there on the web. And after a while, we were contacted by this Dutch guy from China who had just seen some of our work, and he thought, well, it would be a good idea to do a test project together before moving on to full projects. So we had nothing to lose, we immediately accepted, and he sent us the brief. It was sort of a, an extension of the house towards the backyard. It was really nothing too complex, but the only problem was we only had one day to do it. So we worked our asses off, we stayed up all night working. We wanted to impress our new client as much as we could, so we would put an extra finishing touch to the image. But unfortunately, we failed to understand who we were working for and what they really wanted. 
The client disliked the image, saying that it is too gloomy, that the brick is not the brick he requested, and he was really freaked out about, about this little girl in the backyard. So um, we were, uh, this was probably our first important lesson in the importance of material and style of references. And after just seven rounds of final corrections, we managed to <laughs> match the sunniness of the image and the reference brick, as you can see, it's very beautiful. And um, this was, this was probably, this was our first actual client. This is our persistence, we probably managed to continue on working with him. And this was our first actual client because he didn't come from a freelance website. So, eventually the original Dutch Chaos image was published on V-Ray Workshop Type of the Week, Top 5 of the Week, making it the first of our images to be published outside of Ronan Beckman's forum. So, we finalized two more projects with our Dutch client, but at this point, we started to face some technical difficulties. We were still working from our homes and still using our old home desktops, and it was really hard for us to handle any sort of a larger file and to work from a distance. So we realized that we should invest the money from Dutch clients, uh, from Dutch projects, sorry, uh, to in some new equipment and in to form a small budget for an office for six months and see where it takes us. So we found this old uh, convention center. It's actually, the building itself was a modernist icon of the 70s, but the office space itself was rather strange. It was a former boutique selling pillar here. This was our office here. It was a former boutique selling pillar here, and it was surrounded by other shoe stores. And also in the building, there was a headquarters of a security company. So there were guards constantly passing by our window, commenting on the fact that two bearded guys are sitting all day long playing video games. So, <laughs> Also, on the other side of the wall, there was a banquet hall, and probably every Saturday, the work was accompanied by a sound of a Serbian wedding. We had to get at each other in order to communicate. So, this was our office. This was our archivist artifact. Two PCs, peripherals from home, a couple of speakers, kettle for coffee, where we set to start working. And on the first day in our office, we sat down to discuss further plans for the business, and we also contacted our Dutch client to see if there's any more work. And he actually told us that he's leaving the archivist business because the market went under. So we were a little freaked out, but we had, we had nothing to lose, and we were determined to do this. So we started scra scrapping smaller local jobs, mostly from friend recommendations, and they weren't always necessarily related to archivists. So after a while, we were contacted by a friend uh, via Facebook. He has seen some of our work, and he really liked it, so he thought it would be a good idea to hire us to refurbish some of his old projects. So he said that he would pay us in fully and that we could use the image for promotional purposes as much as we like. So this was really good for us. And so the project was actually a Montenegrin competition held in 2012. It was a uh, complex residence, but mainly purpose for artists. And the idea was he was going to provide us with the raw renders and we were going to do the post-production on top of it. But the problem was, that is, our main concern was that we didn't have any photos from the location. And since it's a predominantly mountain landscape, we were aware of the fact that we would have to improvise and composite everything from scratch. So we took our time. It took us like four or five days to complete the image. We were rusty at the time, considering the fact that we hadn't worked together in a while. But it turns out we had a golden opening. Uh, the image was highlighted on both uh, Ronan Beckerman and Miri Workshop Top 5 every week. But more importantly, Ronan contacted us himself. He really liked the image, and he wanted us to write a making-of article about the image. And this was the first time we were called in to write a making-of article about one of our images, as well as about our workflow. So, defining our current workflow took some time, because in the beginning, it was rather, rather chaotic. But over time, we managed to make some sense of it. So basically the key for us was to organize the folder structure of the project since it correlates with the, uh, with the, <laughs> the workflow we employ because we have divided the workflow in two phases. And these are the input phase, the modeling, the rendering, and the post-production phase. Now, every information that we get about the project helps us to make a better image in the end. So upon receiving the initial request for a commission from a client, we sent him out this PDF file which contains a description of all the info we need, as well as of our workflow to get him acquainted with it. And basically, these are your plans, site references, mood references, furniture references, etc. And now, emailing is a very great tool for communicating, but 
Even better is when we actually have the chance to talk to the client. Because during this conversation, we can find out many little things about the project and also get some personal insights uh, from the client itself. So we call it contributes to a better image in the end. Yet another level up from this is when you actually have a chance to go on a trip with the client and visit the site itself. So this happened to us once. We were working with a small group of uh, young architects from Serbia. And they were doing a competition in a small Croatian town. It was a city reconstruction competition. And they invited us to go along with them and visit the site. So basically, it was a road trip during which we had enough time to discuss every little detail about the project. And uh, upon returning home, we finished the images with uh, little to none corrections. Now, an important thing that we learned about the project info is that the more you know from the start, the less stress you will have near the end of the project. And we also learned that if you are not sure about something, do not assume, just ask. Because in the beginning, we just assumed. And it was hard at times because <laughs> we, we just assumed because we were actually we were thinking that it was shameful to ask for clarification of something because we thought it would make us look less professional. And then we spent a lot of times just reading the mails and ruminating over them. And the worst case scenario was when we thought we understood things, but we understood it totally differently. And then the both of us would start arguing, and it was a terrible waste of time. So now we just simply ask if we do not understand something. <laughs> but coming up next, one, once we receive the info, we go to the modeling part of the process. And I think we can all agree that modeling is most exciting at times when you are either learning something new or you are trying to figure out a way to do some uncertain thing, or both at the same time. But I think we can also all agree that modeling can be a drag, especially when you are fixing someone else's mistakes or when you are working with some pretty bad instructions. Now, a healthy, well-based model is the foundation for everything that follows. And even though that we are very keen on editing things later on in Photoshop, there are just some cases where this is not an option. One of such cases was a project that we did. It was a competition for a city, city block in Belgrade. And the program was that the uh, block had an intermodular station on one end and a housing and commercial complex on the other end of the block. So basically, upon receiving the initial request from the client, uh, as usual, Igor and I just sat down and started to discuss you know, like, uh, what should be modeled and what can we place after in post-production. And luckily for us, the location was very near our office, so we quickly packed our bags and went off to take photos of the location. But unfortunately for us, there was no context. At least not the one that we could use, because everything was in ruins and covered in garbage, and we just realized we can't present a fancy new city block in such light, so right there on the spot, we decided to model everything from scratch. So now while modeling, we apply just a few basic principles, and the two most important for us are to, uh, to divide the model into layers according to the materials and to, and to work from simple volumes down to a detailed model. <laughs> now, this second one, this second commandment is actually harder for us to follow because uh, once we are working with detailed plans, we can just get easily carried away and just model a single element while the rest of the model is not even set up. So, Basically, we try to avoid this trap as much as we can. And on this project, it was fairly easy to follow these two principles because the whole idea of the project was to communicate the concept rather than to give out specific information about the definitive appearance of the buildings. So every project the element was closely linked and it helped to keep us on track. Uh, now, for the modeling, we usually start in SketchUp for the basic volumes because it's just more simple for us to do it that way. And then we move on to 3ds Max. And the detailing part for this project was fairly simple because we talked in advance about instancing and we viewed simple volumes as something that could later on be a repetitive detailed uh, model. So uh, this was actually the first time that we modeled uh, something of this size and the first time that we modeled the, that we employed a modeling strategy for it. So after tackling this project, we uh, always just take a step back and think about the process, the modeling process, before, instead of just jumping head first. And also, this was the first project that we worked on that uh, where every image from the set was highlighted on both Beckerman and Weary uh, Workshop Top 5. So after finishing with the model, uh, we move on, of course, to the rendering process. Now, I would very much love to say that the rendering begins and ends with the press of the render button, but I think we all know that is not true. It involves a lot of new elements being introduced and it's often time consuming and there is still a lot of going back and forth between the model and render. So basically we're not sure in creative terms where the modeling ends and rendering begins. 
But for us though, the rendering process begins from the, from the moment we fix in our virtual camera. So from the moment we're satisfied with the composition. From that moment on, everything that we do is related to this precise projection. And so we can have a bare, fairly simple mo model, which is essentially too use useless in the practical scenario. But once we pick up on the camera position, we can start detailing it. And very fast, we will have one convincing scene. So when you think about it, it's actually quite the opposite from street photography, for example, where you are chasing circumstances in the world filled with content. Here, you are creating content uh, in the world that is lacking it. And one of such examples was a simple housing project that we did. It was in Norway and had this typical Norway house design. And the client wanted a couple of exteriors, of course. And he wanted only two interior shots, but everything had to be shown. So our initial batch of test angles was uh, oh, like we had to use over-exaggerated field of view, and they were really, really, really weird composition-wise. And we were not happy with this. Luckily for us, uh, at that time, we ran across the article that uh, Lars from Xoia wrote, and it's about the photographic approach in ArcVis. And here he writes in great detail about many elements of architectural photography, and as well as gives out some useful tips for V-Ray and 3ds Max, and which would eventually make us think outside the box on this one. So basically what we figured out is that we could use a clipping plane and just clip off the uh, foreground elements, and thus this enabled us to create a central composition. We could also narrow our field of view and achieve a calm perspective, and we could fit everything in the scene the way we wanted to. And once we were happy with the, the position of the camera and the composition, we could uh, get more insight into the overall hierarchy of the elements in place. And this is an important thing to mention, uh, is, uh, the hi this hierarchy is important to get a feel of the scale of the space. So I remember that my drawing teacher used to say that if you can't draw a convincing jacket, for, for example, just by drawing in the contours, then you must continue on to add details, such as pocket sleeves and so on, just to make it look more convincing. And it's basically a principle we apply when we create scenes. If the scene cannot stand alone, alone with the elements in place, we just keep adding details and just make it look more simple. So another very, very important aspect of the rendering process is, of course, the light. And we always try to achieve a dynamic of light and shadow play in, the, in our images, and this, this scene was no exception. Uh, the setup was also fairly simple. We just had an HDRI for the global lights. We had some very plain lights and some frontal lights to control the frontal shadows, and the result that we got was this. So if you just take a look at this image, you can notice that the light is moving from the right side to the left side of the room, of course, due to the extra window. And having realized this quality, we even accentuated it even more in post-production later on. And this is an important thing to say. Whenever we are in this, in this rendering part of the process, we always think a few steps ahead in regards to what can be manipulated later on in Photoshop. And once we are talking about this, uh, it's also important to mention the colors and the textures of the scene. And uh, even though this image particularly was heavily manipulated in Photoshop, some basic color balancing can be seen in the relation between the warm and the cold elements. Because with the bottom end of the image, we were aiming toward warmer spectrum, and while the rest of the image is just different shades of gray, which would eventually get some bluish tints later on in the post-production process. And to finish off the render talk, I would just like to mention that uh, the image that we worked on, this image, the Trovini interior, was eventually published as the best image of the week on Beckman's phone, making it the first of our images to receive this kind of recognition. Okay, so going through, oops, going through all these phases of image making really makes you realize how, even though they are all a part of the same process, every individual phase is an infinite world of its own. So over the years, we have managed to gather some experience and to form a somewhat uh, linear and flexible workflow, which we would like to share with you guys. And it's essentially, it can essentially be divided into three basic phases or groups, if you will. So the base render phase, the compositing phase, and the mastering phase. So the base render phase is pretty self-explanatory. The idea is to create a base render group on top of which you can later build up the rest of your image. So we use these render passes in order to accentuate or annulate certain effects in a render on top of the original RGB pass. So we usually start by logical groups of passes. We start with the illumination passes, continue on to the reflection passes, and finish off with special elements passes. And once we are done with this base setup, we then analyze the image to see if there's any more individual elements that need further adjusting. 
And then, if so, we just mask out these elements and add these adjustments. So the general idea is to get a overall good balance of contrast and color, and this is really important uh, step because in the next phase you will be introducing new elements and matching their levels to the already determined one in ones in this phase. So the next phase is com the compositing phase, and it is in this phase that we introduce all of the external elements into the scene. And by external elements, we mean literally any element ranging from the scene background all the way to the last cutout people you insert. And it is probably the most time consuming of all phases and really a big unknown in terms of estimated time of delivery. For instance, the Trollvinian interior that we discussed uh, didn't require all that much compositing work to be done since it was just a, a personal view perspective interior. So it just had these couple of windows behind which we fitted in a couple of houses and we fitted in a little boy in the middle of the scene and the scene worked. But if you're dealing with an aerial image, for example, you will have a, large, a much larger scale and a more specific perspective, and you will need a lot more time to find adequate resources and to blend them in. So, how do we go about compositing? Well, the way you plan out to position your scene elements will in a great deal influence the order of your compositing. And we have uh, several rules, several basic rules that we like to follow which help us to determine this order. And they are the elements hierarchy, the element's overall impact on the scene, the depth position of an element, and time required to blend in an element. And it is important to mention that these rules are in no way linear or complementary, and they can even often be contradictory to, to, between each other. But uh, once you get the hang of it, you will realize when to apply each rule to your scene. So the element hierarchy refers to the logical order of element placement. For example, if you know for a fact that your scene will contain some sort of background and some cutout people, it is more logical to blend in the background if, because uh, first, because the scene can stand alone with the background, but the scene would just cut out people and no background would just play weird. And overall impact of the scene of the elements, we usually go from larger to smaller scene impact elements. Uh, for instance, if your sky in the back takes up like 20 to 30 percent of the image, we can say that it will greatly influence the way you perceive the image. So in this case, it is best off to start with these elements. And lastly, the last two rules are usually connected to each other, and they are the depth position of an element and time required to blend in the element. And the general idea is to start off with the foreground elements and to build up to the background ones. And there are several reasons for this. Since your foreground elements are a lot closer to you and there's a lot more detail being shown, you will need a lot more time to blend them in properly. So uh, it is best off to start doing this while you're, while you're more concentrated and focused in the beginning to devote your attention to the elements that need the most. And uh, a second reason is, of course, uh, the elements you introduce to the foreground will eventually block a lot of stuff you put in the back. So it would be unwise to start with the background in such cases. So how do you go about blending in an element? Well, uh, it depends on an element you wish to introduce to your scene. For example, if you're introducing uh, new textures to enrich your existing ones, you will probably most likely be doing a lot of uh, retransforming and blend mode testing. But if you're introducing solid elements such as people and vegetation, you will, other than transforming, you will probably be doing a lot of uh, local layer adjustments and brushing in local shadows and lights. But it's best off to start uh, to talk about this kind of things on a practical example. So once we are satisfied with the uh, overall individual elements, element levels in the scene, we move on to the final phase of post-production, that is the mastering phase. Now, we're not really sure if mastering exists as a formal term in image production, but in audio production, the mastering represents the process of transferring the final mix onto the data storage media, like CD or something. So what is interesting is that once they are doing this, they actually flatten out the mix. So the engineer who is working on mastering is actually doing it on a flat format of the file. And this is the resemblance which we saw in a part of our own workflow, where once we are done with all the compositing, we just start doing layer adjustments and a painting on top, of a, on top of all the layers as if it was a flat image. So what does mastering actually include? Well, it's important to mention that from this moment onward, we're starting to observe the image as a whole rather than just focus on individual elements in the scene. And the purpose of this phase is to further uniform the, the image and as well as to make it pop in different aspects. So we usually start off with the brushwork brushing in uh, smaller highlights and shadows so that we could bring out detail in the important elements in the composition. Then we start gradually increasing our brush size and start brushing in, of course, also shadows and highlights. And this contributes to the overall softness of the scene. And finally, 
uh, we increased the size of the brush even more and start brushing in these lights, these big lights and shadows. And they usually contribute to creating this overall gradient or vignette, if you will, which we already talked about in the throw beam interior. And its purpose is usually to redirect the focus point of the observer. So you got the picture. Throughout different scaling of your brush sizes, you can achieve a different range of effects, ranging from detail to overall softness, the light, uh, and finally redirecting the focus point of the observer. And all of this is uh, simply being achieved by painting in black or white colors on top of your image and alternating blend modes to achieve the appropriate effect. So once we are done with all the brush work, we move on to final adjustment layers. And these final adjustment layers usually have the purpose of uh, finally pushing, ultimately pushing the image to see if there's any more further contrast that we can achieve or color-wise or any, any way possible. So, and uh, we feel we should mention a plugin that we use for this purpose and it is the almighty infamous uh, Magic Bullet plugin. Uh, we've been using it less and less for the past couple of months, but the main reason we still use it is in order to get a feel in which direction the image can turn. Because it's, it's a really good unbiased tool in determining this, because it, all, it has all of these presets which can majorly influence the overall look and atmosphere of your scene. You can get a pretty good idea of really quickly in which direction the image can go. So we usually choose three different kinds of presets and we apply them in between each other using layer opacity. And so the image that we discussed this on was actually a Guggen Kankelsky proposal done by Architecture Studio from Brazil, Basio. And there's really nothing special about the project itself other than it being our first Guggen Kankelsky proposal that we worked on. So. so let's just now for a moment uh, look how all the, all the theoretical talk applies in some practical examples. And for this occasion we chose a couple of projects that we think clearly illustrate uh, each part of the post-production steps. So upon, of course, finishing the rendering, we're done, and we move on to Photoshop and insert all of the render elements in. As Igor mentioned, first we start to blend in the illumination passes, and we overlay the GI pass to achieve more contrast of the image, and blend in the, uh, the uh, layers that deal with the direct light of the image. So there are some situations, though, where uh, the light dynamic of the image is not so pronounced uh, due to the lack of contrast of light. So uh, then we uh, kind of have a little trick that we use. We go a bit deeper into the layer and in the blend if brackets we can isolate either light or shadow from a pass. And this way we can accentuate and further dramatize the image the way we want it to. So upon doing this, uh, we move on to the reflection passes, and there is really nothing special like it. raw reflection and raw reflection passes that we mix and combine uh, in order to bring out certain elements or to emulate certain elements. So we have no basic rules here. We just scroll down the blend mode menu and see what works best for a particular scene. And we finish off the render passes with some special elements that we use. And we use extra text with the Vray Dirt. It's basically an additional ambient occlusion pass just in case we want it more pronounced. And we use the diffuse filter, and it's a very, very uh, basic render pass, but it contains the information about the grain of the texture. So basically, if an element is lacking detail, we can easily bring it back uh, by masking out the, the and overlaying the diffuse filter. And also, while we are doing all of this blending, we desaturate layers in order to avoid color glitches in, in Render, but this results also in the overall desaturation of the entire image. So basically, we blend in the, uh, the diffuse filter with the color blend mode so we can bring back the last color of our base. And finally, we blend in the ZZ depth layer, and uh, this layer we use for uh, contributing to the overall depth of the image and to the overall mood and the atmosphere of the base. And uh, all the changes are very incremental, but combined all together make a really big difference in the way that we perceive the image. And uh, this is how the image looked like after we were done basing it, and this is how it looked like after the compositing and the mastering was done. And we will discuss compositing on an example. This was a competition in Bosnia. It was for a ski center that is located in, uh, in a natural resort. And like, a particularity about this is that we did not take part in the modeling or rendering the team that was doing the competition. They just asked us to do the post-production on top of it. So basically they just sent us this and we started to work. And as you can see, everything is pretty uh, rough, pretty web-like. 
So basically, we start dealing with this. First, we fill in the background, of course, just to fill in the entire image to get a sense of the scene. And uh, we really liked how this sky worked uh, compositionally, but it was pretty low quality. So it had some artifacts, it had some jagged edges, but we really liked how it works, so we basically uh, overlaid the high-pass filter and uh, we removed all the artifacts. We moved on next to the background mountains, of course, just cutting out and blending in the mountains, and the background was set. At this point, we would actually just check everything for mistakes and move on. And move on to the foreground, of course. And if you see, the grass in the front is taking a very large portion of the image, so we start dealing with this first. We found a, find a cool image of a grass field, remove the artifacts, and blend, blend it in. So, basically we were pretty happy with what we were getting, but uh, the problem was that uh, we just wanted to add more detail to the grass, just to make it look more inviting, since it's a competition and you have the atmosphere to achieve. So basically we placed some, just some random wildflowers over the, over the image and the foreground was set. Now we want to just share a quick tip with you. Uh, the way we isolated the flowers, we all use the color range select tool. And what we found is that if you place a mask on top of the image, uh, and uh, while keeping the selection of the mask, mask entered the color range select tool, you will see the results instantly happen in, in the main window. So you can be more precise and you can do this a lot faster and that's how we did it in this particular case. And once we were set with the uh, front, so the foreground and the background, the two main elements that we introduced, we just sit back for a moment and just uh, look at the relationship of the elements that we introduced and see how they work together. And since we were alive, we liked what we were getting, we just moved on with the image. So we basically started correcting the trees to match the new tones that we introduced. We started dealing with the lake, which was another big part of the image. So we enhanced the reflections, added the irregularities to them, blended the water surface layer, and <clears throat> the, at this point the image is starting to look less and less render-like. I mean, so basically at this point we start to hunt for things that still remain in the original render state, and as you can see on the uh, bottom left corner there are some blocks, and these are actually houses, so Basically, we find appropriate images of housing and blend them in. And luckily for us, they are very far away, so we really didn't have to worry if the perspective didn't match perfectly or anything, uh, because we could still maintain uh, our convincing results with some minor mistakes. So, moving on with the image, we start dealing with the roof, because this texture is just terrible. And we replace it with something more subtle and realistic. And while doing all of this blending and importing, we just keep in mind the contrast, the color, and the light of the element we are blending. So we just minor correct the bridge, add some more details to the background, and now the image was ready for one important aspect, and this is the people. Now, well, before placing the people, we always take a step back and think about what works best in terms of composition, because people are an element that can help you manipulate the composition in a certain way. And if you analyze this image, you can see that the, there's a line leading from the bridge to the right. So we basically wanted to add some guides to the left, and we placed some people following this line. So we balanced out the composition. Uh, after this was done, uh, it was only a matter of crowding the scene and putting the people to contribute to the overall atmosphere of the scene. And the people were set, and we were ready to start to blend them in. And this is an important thing to mention before. Uh, we always first place the people without blending them. We just place to see what works best in terms of composition. And once we are happy with what we are getting with their disposition, we start to blend them in. And we will just run through one of the group and just describe our process. So basically, as I said, first we start dealing with the contrast. So we level out the contrast, we deal with the color, we level out the color, usually color balance tool. Uh, we deal with some local lights and some local shadows, and we finish off by placing the main shadows, and we can say that we have blended the person in. Now I mentioned that we use a lot of color balancing, uh, especially with the people, and what we found is that before we were you know, just moving these sliders very carefully, very slightly, very gently, now we just go to the extremes, and just go to the extremes because you can see which channel affects which part of the image. So you can basically not look, not look in the, just focus on the image and just slide until you reach a middle ground. And you can do this fairly quickly. Another thing that was really bothering us out while placing the people was of course the cutting out process. And what we found, especially if you have a tablet or something, that you can quickly just trace around the edges of the people 
using a mask, and then enter this mask, you will have a silhouette. So you can select the silhouette very, very easily, delete the mask while keeping the selection, and just by placing a new mask, you will have a fast pattern. So this is the image after the compositing was done, and this is the image after we applied the mastering group on top of it. And we will discuss mastering in the example of the three squares competition that was held in Belgrade this summer. And we'll just wait for the group. Uh, this is, okay, this is, never mind, never mind. So, first, we started off with, as Igor said, some minor adjustments and, my, and brushing in and burning and lodging light and shadows and some areas of interest. After that, we moved on to the mid size treatment to soften out the image to bring out the contrast even more. And after this part was done, it was time to think about the overall, what we were trying to achieve with this image. Like, uh, what feeling do we want to communicate by, with this? And we wanted to give it you know, like some sort of a lazy, sunny afternoon feel to the image. So basically, we started painting a light in the back and started to diffuse it even more in the front. Now, while doing this, we also started to establish a focal point that this is the central square. So we uh, also wanted to pronounce it even more, so we burned in the, the foreground uh, at some sort of vignette. And as a finishing touch, we just added a bit of access light to, uh, to the left side just to balance out the composition. And we were uh, set for the final adjustment layers. Now you remember I said that we wanted this warm feeling to the image, and this is pretty cool, we will all agree. So basically, we started applying uh, presets. So we warmed the entire thing up. We also want to accentuate the light and the sky, uh, the, the, the light coming behind the building, that feeling of, of some kind of dramatization. So basically we uh, isolated the lightest parts of the diffuse filter and blended it in. So we achieved a halo effect in the image. Uh, one final touch was just uh, dealing with some minor color corrections on the overall level of the image. And this was pretty much a finished image. At this point, we would just, again, take a look at the image, see what's going on, see if there are some things that we are not happy about. And uh, in this particular case, uh, we wanted the image to be warm, but this was getting a bit too warm for our taste, uh, especially in the shadows. So uh, we just applied a correction and added some bluish tints to the shadows, thus emulating this effect and achieving the color contrast even more. And we just finished off with a bunch of contrast. And this was the final image. So you can see the results before we, we did the mastering part of the process, and we can, you can see the results after, and I think they are pretty obvious. So there you have it. We have walked you through our process from the first nail to the finished image. And before we end this presentation, we just want to say one more thing. In February this year, we were contacted by this very cool guy, and he asked us uh, if we wanted to speak in public about the way we make images. So we want to use this opportunity to thank Fabio Paldelli and the rest of the D2 crew for having us here this year. And we also want to thank all of you for taking part in yet of another of our firsts. Thank you.
Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you.